good to be with you all again today. Do you want to open up to 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 to 7? In the same way, wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands so that even if some disobey the word, they may be won over without a word by the way their wives live when they observe your pure, reverent lives. Don't let your beauty consist of outward things like elaborate hairstyles and wearing gold jewellery or fine clothes, but rather what is inside the heart the imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. For in the past, the holy women who put their hope in God also adorned themselves in this way, submitting to their own husbands, just as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. You have become her children when you do what is good and do not fear any intimidation. Husbands, in the same way, Live with your wives in an understanding way, as with a weaker partner, showing them honour as co-heirs of the grace of life, so that your prayers will not be hindered. This is the word of the Lord. So marriage is a topic that we've talked about a fair bit this year. I mean, we had Patricia Wirakun come and we had sessions with her talking about marriage. We had a whole series called God and Sex where we talked about marriage. Marriage popped up again in Malachi and, you know, they were the people making a joke out of marriage. We've talked about it a lot and now we get to 1 Peter and what do we have again? We've got marriage. But man, read that out there in today's context and I'm going to get cancelled, right? Like that's some pretty out there stuff for today's society. Um, But that's just it. We've got to read this in context. Remember, this is part of the letter that Peter's written, but it's also part of the Bible, and that's God's word. We read in 1 Peter 2, 2 to 3, that God's word is like pure milk. It's something that we should crave. It's something that will help us grow. So we need to make sure we're coming to something like this with that in mind. This stuff is good, and it's helpful as we live as members of the chosen race, the royal priesthood, God's holy nation. So let's pray and then we'll let's dig into it. Lord God, we thank you that your word is good. Thank you that it is all useful for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness. Through your Holy Spirit, please help us to understand more clearly your plan for us particularly for us as we live as your people in this world. Amen. So in the intro to this letter by Peter, Peter lays out who we are, that we are a holy nation, a people chosen by God, but we are strangers in this world. He points out that this is only possible because of Christ. Then he goes on to say how this should play out in the life of God's people. So last week, Bernard took us through uh, chapter 2, verses 11 to 25, and he drew out the idea that proclamation and practice have to go together. We were given some general principles for honourable conduct. Know your identity as strangers in this world and as living stones. You will therefore be different. This will be hard, but conduct yourself honourably, follow Jesus, He is the template, display him to the world. So today let's look at how we do this in marriage. Now the first four words remind us straight away why proclamation and practice go together. In the same way points us back to Jesus. So let's remember Peter is writing this letter to Christians living in a very non-Christian environment. They're strangers, they're aliens, foreigners, They are different and should be different. So remember again the principles. You will be different. It will be hard. But display God to those around you. Follow in the steps of Jesus. 
in the same way reminds them, as you live as strangers, live the same way as Christ. Live in the same way as Jesus has demonstrated through his life and his death. Jesus served. Think back to when he washed his disciples' feet. Jesus submitted. He demonstrated this through his submission to his Father's will and dying on the cross for our salvation. Jesus suffered. Fulfilling his Father's will was not easy. So there's the template. The one who saved you has shown you how to live radically different lives in this world, and he did it all to bring his Father glory and honour. So now do as Jesus did, and do it in your marriages. So I'm at point three. Let's look at what Peter has to say to wives. So he starts by addressing them, wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands. All right, so here's a tricky word, isn't it? Submit. So today's culture would tell us uh, that submit means you are of lesser value. You are not as important. When you look at the idea of selfism, and that would say, you know, seek first what's best for you. So if you are submitting to others then that's not right. You know, you should be putting yourself first. Submitting to others means that you are of less value. You do not matter as much. That's not what this means. We know that because of our reading from Genesis, that man and woman were both created in the image of God. Man and woman are equal in God's sight. So submit here is not a value term. Submit is a role term. Consider for a minute ballroom dancing. Okay, so I used to do ballroom dancing when I was a kid. And the first thing that I learned very quickly was that one of us had to lead and the other followed. Okay? When this works, which I'll admit it didn't often work for me very well when I did this. I was too young. Anyway, when it works, the image is beautiful. It's graceful. But you can't both lead and you can't both follow. You'll end up stepping on each other's feet. It will not be graceful. Someone leads and someone follows and you both work together. And I believe it's the same for marriage. You know, uh, someone leads and someone follows, but we're both equal. We're both equal under God's eyes. Remember how God designed this in Genesis. God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper corresponding to him. Eve was created to correspond to Adam. Later she's described as a helper. So both Adam and Eve were created with different qualities and different responsibilities. And this worked. This was God's good design and plan for marriage. The relationships and the roles were set and they worked for God's glory to mirror the relationship of Christ and the church. So Peter is calling wives to fulfill this role as it was designed so that the wife can display Jesus in this relationship. This will look different in different marriages, but the principle's there. If you practice what you proclaim, wives submit to your own husbands, just as Christ submitted to his father. So what is the reason Peter gives for why the wife should submit? So that even if some disobey the word, they may be won over without a word by the way their wives live. So here's a very specific instruction. Wives, in particular, those who are married to unbelievers, submit to your husbands, submit, sorry, submit so that your husbands will see Christ lived out in your life. So it's a spiritual consequence of a life lived in purity and reverence. God will work through your life as you live to honour him. He will use your practice so that the gospel is proclaimed. Now, does this mean we never use words to proclaim the gospel? No, I don't think it does. We've got to remember, this is a very specific scenario, right? Um, Particularly a a Christian woman married to a non-Christian man, which is not an easy situation. I mean, think back to then, the husband being a non-believer probably is a worshipper of other gods and other idols. So there would have been a lot of pressure to conform. But remember that submit doesn't mean compromise. So it would have been very difficult. 
and I believe it's still no different now. So we know proclamation and practice must go in hand in hand. In other words, we speak it, we live it. But in this situation, Peter says, there is more to be said for actions than words. I think this idea of submission to point Jesus, to point to Jesus is something for wives of Christian husbands too. Wives conducting themselves in a godly, honourable manner will help point their husbands toward Christ. For non-Christian husbands, this will mean showing them Christ. For Christian husbands, it will mean helping them and continuing to encourage and point them towards Christ and grow closer towards Christ. So Peter then goes on to contrast outward beauty with inward beauty. Now, we all like to think that we look good, don't we? Like, appearance is something that should be important, isn't it? At least that's what the world says. You know, you look at magazine covers and you go, wow, look at that good-looking person. Oh, and they say, do this and you can be good-looking like me. Imagine if you got a magazine and on the cover it said, live a quiet, reverent life. Would that sell? I don't think it would. It's too different. It's not, it's not normal. Peter shifts our thinking away from outer beauty. He says true beauty is not how you look, the things that you wear, the way you do your hair or your makeup or your jewellery. True beauty is found in verse 4 in what is inside the heart, the imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit. So remember the audience again here. Christians are strangers in the world. In particular, Christian wives of non-Christian husbands living in a very difficult situation. They are not going to stand out and point people to Christ by looking good. They will point people, including their non-Christian husbands, to Christ by their actions and how they reflect Christ. The end of verse 4 is particularly important. This sort of honourable conduct is of great worth in God's sight. So the motivation behind submission, behind living a pure and reverent life, is because this is what God values. Not he, God's not interested in good-looking babes, right? God values the one who lives their life mirroring the sun, a gentle and quiet spirit. Now Peter doesn't leave wives without an illustration. He reminds them of the holy women from the past, in particular Sarah, who obeyed Abraham and called him Lord. We know from Genesis that Sarah was an attractive woman. Every time Abraham took her somewhere new, kings were trying to take her off him. But does Peter mention that? No, he doesn't mention anything about her looks. He talks about her true beauty. He talks about how her true beauty was found in her hope in God. He talks about how her true beauty was found in how she submitted to her husband out of reverence for God. He talks about how her true beauty was found in the way she honoured her husband and spoke positively of him, both in his presence and when she was not with him. She fulfilled her role in the relationship the way God designed it. Now, was it always easy for her? Read Genesis and you'll see no. So let me just summarise up the instructions to wives before we go on to the husbands. Wives, submit to your husbands as Christ submitted to his father. This will look different to your husbands, whether believer or not, and to society at large. It will be hard, especially for those married to unbelievers. Don't try to win them over with your appearances. Conduct yourselves in line with the women of the past whose conduct was godly so that their husbands could grow more closely to God. So up to point four, husbands. What are the instructions there for us? Well, first, we have the same reminder as wives. In the same way, all that we do is to mirror Christ. But what is the instruction? Live with your wives in an understanding way, as with a weaker partner, showing them honour as co-heirs of the grace of life so that your prayers will not be hindered. So I think in there there's two instructions that work together and then there's ramifications. So the first instruction, 
Live with your wives in an understanding way. I reckon there's probably two aspects to this understanding way. The first being understanding God's grace. If we understand what God has done for us through Jesus, then we will want to live out that grace in all aspects of our lives. It comes back again to the message from last week, you know, practice what you proclaim. So understand Jesus, his service, submission and sacrifice and live like it. In particular, how you live with your wife. So if Christ served, then serve your wife. If Christ sacrificed, sacrifice for your wife. Will this be easy? No. But if you proclaim Jesus as Lord and Saviour, we will know that is true by how you translate that understanding into how you live with your wife. I think the other aspect to understanding is an understanding of who your wife is. What are her needs? What are her interests? What makes her tick? What makes her cranky? Do you understand who your wife is and how she is going? Both of these understandings, I think, go together. Understand God's grace and our need for it, and that will help you understand your wife and what she needs as the weaker partner. Now, please note, the weaker partner here means physically. This is not spiritually, because we're all co-heirs of the grace of life. We're talking physical strength. So do I know, then, my own physical strength as the husband and the impact that then has on my wife? The other instruction in there is honour. Now, some people might say this is like respect. In fact, I think if you've got an NIV, it probably says the word respect there instead of honour. I think, though, in this case, respect sort of diminishes the um, full meaning of this word honour. Think honour in this situation more like precious or preciousness. Treat your wife like she is precious. The template was set for us, right? To Jesus, the church is precious. We know that's true because he died for it. What better way is there to show how precious something is to you? So husbands, would you die for your wife to show how precious that she is? God knows how precious she is. We already read about that in the previous verses. We are all co-heirs of the grace of life. And this is a reference back to the inheritance described in chapters 1, verses 3 and 4. So give her the honour, not just because she is your wife, but because she is one of God's holy and precious people. Now the end of verse 7 gives us a reason why this is so important. So that your prayers will not be hindered. So once again, there's spiritual consequences to honourable conduct. Our relationship with God will not be right. It will be hindered if our relationship with our wife is not right. To the point where our prayers won't get heard. Intention within marriage is never fun or easy. But have you ever considered that by not honouring your wife, by not treating her with understanding, your own relationship with God is hindered to the point where your prayers are not even happening properly anymore? I mean, consider the ramifications of that, particularly in your marriage and your household. If Christ isn't your central focus, this will reflect in your marriage, which will then impact your prayers, which will then impact your family, your work, your ministry, everything. So don't let your prayers be hindered by not appreciating the great privilege it is to mirror Christ through your love for your wife. So to sum up the instructions for husbands, husbands, know who your wife is, understand her needs, understand her place in God's kingdom, honour her and treat her as precious so that your relationship with God will not be hindered. Will this be easy? No. But developing and maintaining a good marriage is God's will, a spiritual activity that is pleasing in his sight. So now we get to apply. Now, I reckon that the instructions in here are all pretty clear 
and understanding its context helps to clarify and give meaning. So that's probably it. I can just stop there. Yeah? Well, I could. But I just want to add two more points and then also just give a suggestion of something that has helped me as I seek to honour my wife in our marriage. So first, nowhere in these seven verses does it say anything to single people. So single people have probably been sitting here going, yeah, move on. I'm, yeah, not for me. Um, which, you know, is because of affair. But I think it's important for single people as it is for marrieds. So first, the example to follow for married people as for single people is the same. I think if Peter were to write a section for single people, it would start with singles. In the same way, look to Jesus. He is your template. As a single person, know your identity, live different, it will be hard, but conduct yourself honourably, walk in the steps of Jesus, display him. Second, I think there'll be some singles who'll be coming to a passage like this uh, in preparation for marriage, in which case I think it's all very applicable then. Uh, In fact, this should give you a good guide for who you should marry. Are you looking for someone who lines up with what is described here? Someone who will seek to mirror Christ with you. If not, are you ready for the ramifications? Third, I think that as a community, it's important for us all to be aware of all the different stages and situations going on so we can support one another and so we can pray for one another. Now, I think this leads on well to my second final point. My second final point. That doesn't make much sense, does it? Um, I think within marriage, it's important to understand the role of each other. This will guide you as you seek to fulfil your role. So wives, as you submit, remember, your husband is seeking to understand you and to honour you with his life. So communicate your needs. Communicate your frustrations. Communicate when you need help to fulfil your role. Uh, in knowing, oh, sorry, I've lost myself. Oh, here we go. Think about Sarah, for example, when she asked Abraham to send away Hagar and Ishmael. Husbands, in knowing your wives are seeking to submit, submission is not an excuse for abuse. The call is to honour your wife not take advantage. Now, both the husband and wife need to work together to mirror Christ, to honour each other and their role and not put each other down. I think comments like, she wears the pants, that completely undercuts this whole passage, doesn't it? Or when you make jokes or comments about your partner, either behind their back or to their face, I think, once again, this, this puts it down, doesn't it? If you want to put your money where your mouth is in your marriage... Walk in the steps of Jesus. Serve, submit, sacrifice. Marriage as God designed it, as the couple as the couple mirror the love of Christ for the church and the church for Christ, is a place for mission, both to each other and to the world, and of spiritual growth. Now, how this is going to play out for each marriage, I can't say. The instructions in this passage are clear, but also broad. So in each marriage, it will play out differently because we are all different people. But we are all one in Christ. We are all co-heirs of the inheritance that is imperishable. We are all precious to God. And so if we know that to be true, it should come out in the way we treat others, in particular in how we deal with our wives and our husbands. So my, my actual final thing, <laughs> something that I've found helpful in my marriage uh, and seeking to honour my wife and understand her better. There's this really great book by Gary Chapman and it's called The Five Love Languages. And what he suggests is that there's five ways that people express and receive love and that as married couples, it's important to understand the love language of the other person. Now, I'm a words of affirmation man. That means I like to be told that I'm loved 
and I like it when people say nice things about me to me. Okay? Haley, my wife, is an acts of service woman. She feels loved when someone does something for her. For me, it's natural to express my love for Haley through words. Sometimes I probably overdo it. But that's not what she needs. She feels love. Uh, bleh, that's not what she needs. I can tell her till I am blue in the face that I love her, but it will mean nothing compared to taking the kids for a walk when she's had a rough day or seeing that there's a mess and cleaning it up without being asked or, biggest one, my least favourite of all jobs, if I wash up. I hate washing up. (laughs) But this is a way that I've sought to understand who my wife is and how I can honour her and point her to Jesus. Now, it's not easy because, as I said, I'm a words man, so to do takes a lot of effort. Uh, But it's been very helpful for us. Now, I know that there's people out there that don't buy into the love languages. That's fine. But can I just leave you with this one last thing? God understands us. He knew our greatest need. Did he use a love language to meet that? John 3.16, For God loved the world in this way. He gave his one and only Son, so that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Let me pray. Lord, thank you for the gift of marriage. Thank you for how it mirrors Christ's love for the church and the church is for Christ. Thank you for this passage today and how Peter lays out how we can mirror Christ in our marriages. Please help all of us as we seek to practice what we proclaim, to live as valued and precious members of your kingdom and to demonstrate to the world the goodness and joy found in knowing you. Amen.